If you look at the top of the page, it says a double congruency proof. When you're trying to prove two triangles congruent, you may not be given enough to prove those two triangles congruent. So you have to look for other triangles so that you can use parts because congruent or corresponding parts of congruent triangles are congruent. So we can use that congruent triangle to help us prove the triangle we want to be congruent. So that's a double congruency. So if you look at question number one, there's one, two, three, four triangles within that picture. So if you have highlighters, it's good to use highlighters. We're given, so step number one, that's really big. We're given that angle one is congruent to angle two, angle three is congruent to angle four. And I want to show that triangle B, C, E, is congruent to triangle D, C, E. We have to recall when we use CPCTC and when we use just our basic uh, triangle congruency, one of our postulates, because I'm not proving two sides or two angles congruent, it's not a proof that would end in CPCTC, but we may want to use it to prove um, the triangles congruent. Now, in this question so far, or in the two triangles, if you want, you can draw them separately below. We have an angle congruent to another angle. You could do reflexive here, which would give you another side, but I want you to think about it for a moment. I'm going to pause. Is there a way, based on what's given and what's marked in the triangles now, or using another property such as addition, subtraction, reflexive, substitution. Is there a way to get another corresponding part congruent so that I can prove the two triangles congruent? So let's go ahead and write down number two, the reflexive. Um, that was CE congruent to CE So we thought about it. There is no way to get any other parts of those two triangles, as is right now, congruent. So what we need to do is we need to look at the other triangles in the picture. We have the triangles to the right. So in pink, we have triangle DEA and BEA. And then we also, in blue, have triangles CDA and CBA. I'm going to pause the video again and I want you to think about with those around you, could I use any parts, or if I were to prove, say, the pink triangle is congruent, could I use parts of those that are also a part of the yellow to prove the yellow congruent? Can I prove the pink one's congruent first? Or can I prove the blue ones to be congruent and then use parts of the blue ones that would help me to prove the yellow ones to be congruent? So I want you to discuss. You already know? Oh, hold on, we're still recording. So in looking at the triangles drawn separately, I took time to draw the green ones, the blue ones, and the pink ones. Um, the green is respected to the yellow within the picture, but because you couldn't see the yellow too well when I, were, um, when I write with it, I did draw them in green. And looking at the blue triangles, we can use reflexive here on CA. I wouldn't, you can, but I wouldn't write another step. I wouldn't do step three. I would just add it to step number two. So in addition to CE being congruent to CE, I can say that CA is congruent to CA by the reflexive property. Now I have the blue triangles congruent by angle, side angle. So number three, triangle, let's say CBA is congruent to following CBA would have to be what congruency statement? If I said CBA, Kylie? CDA. And again, that's by the angle, side, angle postulate. 
Now, those blue triangles and the yellow ones, which again are in green down here, they overlap right here at CD. So I'm going to say by CP, CTC that CD is congruent to CB. And that's in the picture right here. So number four would be CD congruent to CB because corresponding parts of congruent triangles are congruent CP, CTC. Now, in having that side, I can say these two triangles are congruent by side angle side, side angle side. So number five, triangle BCE is congruent to triangle DCE by side angle side. Okay, looking at example number two, it is given that BF is congruent to CF. BF here, if you highlight, is congruent to CF. We have EF congruent to FA. With those two lines intersecting, I have vertical angles one and two right here, which are congruent. So angle one is congruent to angle two. Because all vertical angles are congruent. Now I'm trying to show that DC is congruent to BG. DC extends across two triangles as well as BG, that side is going across the two triangles. So it's the largest triangles within the picture. Now that I know the angle one is congruent to angle two, I can state that those two triangles are congruent by side angle side. So triangle, let me say CFE, If I say the letters in the order CFE, that would have to be in congruency to the other BFA. By side, angle, side, postulate. Now our whole goal is to prove other triangles congruent, so I can use parts of those to prove the larger triangles congruent, um, which would be if I highlight the whole triangle D, F, C, and B, F, G. My whole goal is to prove those two triangles congruent. Then I can say that this side is congruent to this side by C, P, C, T, C. Now, part of what I had in orange, as I started to highlight, if I look at these two triangles here that I just proved to be congruent, what is also common to both the orange and the yellow are these two angles right here. So I'm going to call this three and four. Those two angles are congruent by CPCTC. So number four, angle three, congruent to angle four, CPCTC. Remember CPCTC follows a triangle congruency statement, so it should follow your postulate for congruency. I also have in the picture in addition to one and two, we also have the angles three and four congruent because they are also vertical angles. And I'm going to add that up here so I don't have to write the statement over. So I know angle three is congruent to angle four. And since one is congruent to two and three is congruent to four, Sean? Thank you, Sean. I do have two threes and two fours, so I'm going to go back and change this one and that one to a five and a six. Five, six, so one, two, three, four, five, six. Change this to a five and a six. Now, because I have angle one congruent to two and angle five congruent to angle six, two and five make up the angle D, F, C and 1 and 6 make up the angle BFG. 
g, and because both parts of those angles are congruent, I can add them together to get the whole angle congruent. So number five, we have angle DFC congruent to angle BFG by the addition property. So at this point, I have within the yellow triangles, I have angle, side, angle, and now angle, side, angle. So those two triangles are congruent by angle, side, angle. Number six, I'm going to call that triangle CFD. That would be congruent if I did CFD, BFG. angle, side, angle. And then last, number seven, I can say that DC is congruent to BG by CP, CT, C. On the back side, we're going to look at the isosceles triangle proof. So in order to prove a triangle to be isosceles, you have to go back to the definition. Uh, the definition of an isosceles triangle states that you have to have at least two sides congruent. So that's what you're looking to show before you say it's isosceles, that you have one side congruent to another side. I want you to recall that in any triangle, so the first part of that table, um, you have angles opposite congruent sides to be congruent and vice versa. Sides um, opposite congruent angles are congruent. So in this picture here, I'm looking to show, so highlighting it in yellow, that triangle VRS is isosceles. So I'm probably, in my guess, looking to show that VR is congruent to VS. So I need to look to show those two sides congruent. And if I can show that those two sides are congruent, then I know that triangle VRS is isosceles. So let's look at our givens. We've got PQ congruent to UT. We have QR, so that's part of the side of the triangle, congruent to ST. And then we also have PS, which goes all the way across congruent to UR. There's no good way to mark that congruency, so I am going to draw them separate. So we have, here's P, Q, S, here's R, T, U, we've got P, Q congruent to T, U, and we've got this side congruent to that side. I don't have the bottom sides to be congruent, but I can get them congruent by using reflexive and addition. So R, S is congruent to R, S, and then I'm going to add that RS to QR to get this whole side and add RS to ST to get this side. So number two is going to be RS congruent to RS by reflexive. And then number three is going to be QS congruent to RT by the addition property. Now the triangles are congruent by side, side, side. So let's say triangle PQS. That would be congruent to triangle PQS UTR. So now that I have those two triangles congruent, I'm going to use parts of those. I'm going to use this angle right here and this angle right here, which up in the picture, that angle R is right here, so I'm going to call that angle 1. This angle right here I'll call number 2, which is right here. And angle 1 is congruent to angle 2 by CPCTC. And because those two angles are congruent and they're within the same triangle, these two sides are congruent VR and VS. 
So once again, in that little triangle, since we had angle one congruent angle two, the sides opposite are congruent. So number six, VR is congruent to VS because in a triangle, and it's good to preface that because it has to be within the same triangle, not two different triangles. In a triangle, sides opposite congruent angles are congruent. And now we're done. Now I can say number seven that triangle VRS is isosceles. So it wasn't just enough that the base angles were congruent. We don't define an isosceles triangle to be in a, a triangle with two angles congruent to be isosceles. We define an isosceles triangle to have at least two sides congruent. So number seven, if a triangle has at least two congruent sides, then it is isosceles. To finish with the perpendicular bisector, two key vocab terms that make up the words perpendicular bisector are perpendicular, so that means the segment has to be perpendicular, and in order to be a bisector, it has to go through the midpoint. Now, you can do a double congruency proof here. You can have a proof with 15 steps or more, okay? We're going to do it in, um, I think, eight steps? No, nine steps. So it's still pretty long, but that is recalling one very important definition of an isosceles triangle. Um, look at what you've got. You've got two isosceles triangles within the picture. You do not have to do the proof this way. If you can remember the theorems and definitions, then you can do it this way. We have isosceles triangle SPZ with PS congruent to PZ. So the largest triangle within that picture is isosceles. Then we also have isosceles triangle STZ, so this small one here at the bottom, with ST congruent to TZ. We're trying to show that PF is perpendicular to SZ and intersects the segment at F, the midpoint. So I have to show that F's the midpoint and that PF is perpendicular to SC and we're done. So my method, I'm going to look at these two triangles right here, PST and PZT. I'm going to do reflexive here to have those two triangles congruent by side, side, side. So number two, I'm going to do PT congruent to PT by the reflexive property. And those two triangles can run by side, side, side. So triangle PTS to triangle PTZ. And the reason for me doing that is because I want to state that these two angles are congruent. Angle SPZ is the vertex angle. It's included between the two congruent sides. So in isosceles triangle, the angle included between those two congruent sides is the vertex angle. If I have, so number four, angle one congruent to angle two, I can state that PF um, bisects um, angle SPZ. So number four, I can state the angles are congruent by CPC, TC, and then five, I know it's an angle bisector because if a segment divides an angle into two congruent angles, then it is an angle bisector. The 
reason why I wanted it to be an angle bisector is because in an isosceles triangle, the angle bisector of the vertex angle is also two other, um, I don't want to say things, but it also does two other things within that triangle. Not only is it an angle bisector, but it's also an altitude and a median going back to that day's notes of the isosceles triangle. So number six, PF is an altitude and PF is a median. And that's because in an isosceles triangle, the angle bisector of the vertex angle is also an altitude and median. So let's take what the altitude does. We said we're doing this in nine, so there's three more steps. The altitude, if you go back to your table, an altitude gives you two perpendicular segments or lines. So because that's an altitude, I know that PF is perpendicular to SZ. Because an altitude of a triangle is perpendicular to the side it's drawn to. Now a median. Two more steps. A median of a triangle gives you a midpoint. So now I know that F is the midpoint of SZ. And that's because a median of a triangle is drawn to the midpoint of the opposite side. So going back to our statement, our definition said that the perpendicular bisector of a side of a triangle is a line segment that is both perpendicular, check, I have it to be perpendicular, and passes through its midpoint, check. So number nine, I can say that PF is the perpendicular bisector of SC. And that is because a line drawn perpendicular to a segment at its midpoint is a perpendicular bisector. Or you can do the if then. If a line is perpendicular to a segment at its midpoint, then it is a perpendicular bisector.